Hello and welcome back. And before we start today's video, I'd just knock a couple of elephants in the room out of the way. Number one, yes, this is a real long video. If you looked at that time bar at the bottom, this is a long one. But if you've come to this video because you just wanted the nice, quick, easy way to learn about whether you should go for this now, as we've already done a before you buy that should be linked below that's way, 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 way shorter than this and just hits the cliff note. So again, if you don't have time, check that one out because this is going to be covering pretty much everything in a deep dive on this system. Second elephant in the room we got to discuss is this system and this. You may be looking at this device because you're upgrading from the DS420 Plus, the DS918 uh, or 920 Plus, and you might be looking at this wondering, is this worthy of an upgrade? So throughout this video, I am going to be referring to the older generation quite a lot. And if you're not clued up on that, don't worry, I'll go easy on you. But just bear in mind that when I'm referring to the older generation, it is because this seems to be remarkably similar to those so you bear that in mind throughout this video but without further ado let's crack on with those titles That is right, this is the Synology DS423 Plus. And when Synology for the last 12 to 18 months has been getting a bit of stick from a lot of the end user base about some of the choices they've been making on CPUs on their system and some question of compatibility, this is a very good return to form in most ways um, when it comes to Synology NASs in the desktop. And we are talking predominantly about the user group often referred to as Soho. Small office, home office, you know, your prosumer, that isn't going fully 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 featured and this device has very much got that target demographic in mind already arriving on the back of previous generations like the ds418 plus and the 420 plus and ultimately to up to this point was always kind of a dual core intel based system that had its wings clipped a little bit compared with the night uh, the ds9 xx plus series above it Synology has been seemingly rejigging the configuration within their portfolio and where devices sit and in some ways, this device has benefited, benefited from that rejigging of the portfolio overall. But I think it would be fair to say that the DS420 Plus has arrived with some long-term Synology users questioning some of that hardware. And we have to talk about that in this video, where we are going to review the hardware and the software of this device. We're going to talk about what we like, some of the things we're less keen on, and we do have to address some of those questions that users have, uh, how this sits when compared to the previous generation, which is no longer available to buy and we both know I'm talking about the DS920 Plus. But let's crack straight on, shall we? So the DS423 um, Plus, knocking around somewhere in the 4, 450 nicker mark, depending on where you are in the world, and of course factoring in your tax, factoring in your shipping, your currency and more. Um, arriving uh, in its uh, four bay state, it is a four drive NAS system for the desktop there, and it is pretty much designed to be that fully featured home NAS there. So let's have a little look at the retail box there. Synology in the past, when it comes to a lot of their desktop systems, have always kind of gone with a little bit of snazzy kind of understated stuff there. They've got their name on the logo there at the top. They've got their name brandished all over the place. And it'll be very easy to look at this and go, oh, it's just the same damn brown box with a different label on it. And not to a point, that's true, but there's lots of very distinct things about this box that are very unique to this device in terms of a lot of the display about it. And... It kind of is a nice middle ground mix there between understated presentation and at the same time definite branding. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking kind of Mac level, Apple level uh, advertising there. If we have a look what we get inside, I will say straight away, uh, this is a device that is very much an eShop purchase. You might see this on the shelf of your local e-retailer, but it's still not going to be predominantly common. Um, the inside the accessories all packaged nice and neatly inside there we've got our uk main sleeve there in uh, individual box again your region your plug we've also got our box of accessories there included inside we have two cat 5e cables again normally a lot of people might expect a little higher grade of cable but this is not a uh, greater than gigabit device ergo cat 5e absolutely fine couple of cables included uh, we have our external uh, i believe 90 watt psu there this is a external psu device there's mixed feelings on external psus it has to be said some users um prefer kind of an internal PSU there in terms of the power you can get for all those system services but this is not an aggressively powered box and also an external PSU limits internal heat generation but also means replacement is a great deal easier and once again 
branded there all the way through standard slick Synology stuff. Um, also we have keys for the lockable hard drive and SSD trays. We have screws for two and a half inch media, three and a half inch drives slot in like a charm. Uh, we have information on your local Synology office location and first time installation guide. And that's really it for your accessories. There's no more in there. Let's get that. Uh, one of the things that's absent in this box, and I've commented on this before, kind of annoyed it doesn't include these little tiny adhesive heat sinks there for the M2NVMe bays inside. I kind of get why Synology don't include them to a point because not everyone's going to use them and you know you might include them and just be generating waste. But at the same time, SSDs, those M2NVMe's that people are going to use in these, they can get real hot. And when they do get hot, it can end up with the drives uh, themselves internally being throttled in order to maintain uh, durability over time. And particularly when a device is going to be on 24-7, most users would recommend M2NVMe's getting installed in these devices to have heat sinks attached to the controller on those drives in order to remove and kind of withdraw the heat from the controller and dissipate it into the air. So these things are stupidly cheap. We are talking cents for some of these. And it always seems really strange to me that Synology have still yet to include M2 NVMe heat sinks on these, particularly when a lot of their upgrade cards have got heat sinks attached. They're clearly aware of heat that gets generated for M2 NVMe's. And particularly when you find out this system uh, allows you to use those M2 NVMe's in a number of different and indeed impressive ways for the scale of the system, I'm just surprised they never include them, but that's just a small one. Also inside, let's grab that box from there. We have the NAS itself. I will comment on the packaging just a little bit there. Again, this is a device that's gonna be shipping from the other side of the world for most users. And we've got like a tiny bit of foam in there. But that's really it, and it's single layer cardboard as well. This is not a rigorously protected box. And yes, most users buying these are going to be buying them unpopular. Technology do not currently provide these devices with hard drives and SSDs included, which again is something I do think will change given the brand has been rolling out its own branded SSD and hard drive media over the last few years. But that packaging is not going to be great if you were to get this thing pre-populated there. So, again, lovely stuff, but if you're going to buy it populated, make sure they layer the hell out of it at the retail level. Uh, the device arrives in this nice little cloth bag. Get that out of there. Marks there when I was handling it before. And that is the device. This is an incredibly familiar chassis. We've seen this chassis running for several years in the kind of plus prosumer and even value series four bays for a while. It's compact, it's low noise. It's just a nice little case all the way around. I've already utilized this for that before you buy video I mentioned earlier on. But I've been pretty upfront about my feelings towards this chassis. I think it's a nice middle ground in terms of aesthetic design and functionality as well. In terms of the overall packet you're getting here with this, you know, with maybe the exception of the lack of those M2 NVMe heat sinks that I talked about earlier on, it's a fairly standard kit there. Yes, it doesn't include your storage media, but it's quite easy to set up. And in terms of accessories included, until Synology start rolling out devices that have got hard drives and SSDs included, which again, I'm not wholly a fan of, but I can see a lot of users that would like that. I think, still think this is a decent enough retail kit, but I think that's enough gibber gabber about the packaging. Let's talk about the device itself and get on to the design. Now, when I talk about design, obviously I've already waxed lyrical about how much I like the design of this chassis, but I should really dig into why that is the case. First and foremost, it is exceptionally well ventilated. Even those bays at the front that are all lockable, it's ventilated all the way around them there. The system fans just behind, they're ventilated all the way along with angles built into the front of that chassis all the way around to aid passive airflow. On the sides, we've got the Synology logos there, which in turn are also ventilation panels. Lovely bit of branding there. On the base of the system, even more ventilation for not only the main controller board, but also ventilation there at the bottom for those M2 NVMEs as well. So although there aren't any heat sinks, at least they've gone to the trouble of venting in the panels they're going in and then on the rear of the device we've got those two active fans there now those active fans can be replaced by silent fans but to be straight with you unless you're utilizing um this system particularly aggressively 
you're never going to really hear those fans. This is a plastic chassis with a metal internal casing, and it is very low noise, low impact, low scan, and even low power consumption uh, based on the hardware architecture and when we've had tests previously using the DS920 there. So that's why I really like this chassis. It's giving you four bays of storage, but in a casing that is not only built for 24-7 heat dissipation and ventilation, but also it's all right on the eye. It's actually quite nice, and having one of these on your desk, it's actually quite nice which you never really think you'll say about servers when most people you hear the word server they think either some nasty pc case or they're thinking of rack mounts in a whole room they have to soundproof just going absolutely bananas um now in terms of the actual design and the ports and connections on the device i hate seagulls um We've got uh, LEDs there on the side there. Synology have been pretty adamant that they will not include LCDs on their system. They don't provide any kind of real-time information about the device when it's in operation. And I know there are some users, and myself to a degree, that would actually quite like to see an LCD panel. Now, what are you going to use it for? Well, first and foremost, I'd like to have a panel that tells me the individual IPs of these ports without having to go into the GUI or using a network manager. I would like an LCD that when this system's beeping, I don't have to log in as an admin, use my two-step authentication and get into the back end to find out more information when an LCD panel would tell me it's a temp issue, it's um, one of the hard drives is you know, disconnected, it's a degraded RAID configuration there, it's unauthorized act. You know, when there are alerts on this system, I would rather to be able to see that information and have the option to patch in and find out more information about it. And even rack mount devices from Synology in the rack station series, although they don't have an LCD panel, they arrive with a mute button for when there's an alert. And I know that seems really weird, and why would I bring that up? Well, because in a rack mount scenario, those are really noisy machines in high enterprise environments. They're generally having a mute button on there, the beeping, you've already got the m massive multitude of fans behind it, and clearly that is there to mute those alerts when they're needed. Whereas this system is a lot smaller, you're probably going to be in closer proximity to it, and when there's an alert when you're patching in, there's a good chance that a mute button wouldn't be a miss on this. And just having an LCD and little bits of, you know, direct access control on the front of the device wouldn't be a crime. It doesn't have to be much, nothing invasive. But I get why Synology are doing that. They want it to be network remote only. But it still would have been a nice feature to include, even if it isn't on a Soho-based uh, target audience now like this. Um, there it is. A USB port there on the front, good news and bad. One, obviously you've got that for USB backups there, so you can take a USB drive, connect it to the front, and you have a multitude of different USB supported um, uh, services inside for your backups there, so you've got your copy there, so you can connect it and you know immediately action a pre-designed USB backup routine, either from the drive to the NAS, or the NAS to the drive with versioning control, filters, and lots of stuff built in there, which is lovely stuff. Um, on top of that, you can utilize that USB for, nope, that's your lot, pretty much storage. You can utilize it for um, UPSs, but really Synology have been really hitting down hard on supported USB peripheral devices on DSM, the Synology uh, software that is included with these devices. And the fact that it's USB 3.2 Gen 1 is also a bit of a kick in the nudges. Now, that CPU inside this device may be a limitation towards taking advantage of USB 3.2 Gen 2, which is twice the speed of normal USB. But still, nonetheless, the fact that Synology have been kind of trimming the abilities of USB and been fairly steadfast on only maintaining USB 3.2 Gen 1 on their systems has annoyed some users, particularly now when finding client devices with that 10 gig USB and even USB 4 is becoming increasingly affordable, particularly in light of um, hardware shortages in Thunderbolt technology when a lot of users are erring towards uh, USB 4 as a viable alternative there, and given the two do migrate well. It's great to have it on there, and there's another USB port there on the rear, but still, I wish Synology would do more with USB connectivity, particularly for home users. Remember, small home and small um, small office and home office users and home lab guys that need to have layers of backup strategy laid out in front of them. They've got the NAS, they've got all the data being sent to it. It's not a backup, though, because the data's all in one place. Um, having another backup they don't want to buy another whole nas they might back up some of it to the cloud but having a usb drive get home connect it back up get rid of it it's a nice it's just a good easy way to do it and i wish sometimes you did more with the usb it's a small gripe but i it's a consistent gripe i have with usb on the Synology. one thing i don't have a gripe with 
On the Synology, in particular this 4 bay, I'm happy with the storage in most ways. Things that I'm happy about, first and foremost, hard drive compatibility on this device. So, for example, unlike a lot of the XS Enterprise Level series where the Synology have really squeezed uh, the level of uh, compatible and supported hard drives and SSDs on their system, it's a great deal broader on their system. So, for example, you can use Synology's own hard drives, the HAT5300, the HAT3300, the SAT5200, the SNV. You can use all of their drives, but you've also got Ultrastar, you've got Exos, you've got WD Red, you've got Seagate Iron Wolf, you've got all of the surveillance drives like Skyhawk and Purple. You can use all of them. And, indeed, you can go ahead and partially populate this device if you choose, or you can fully populate it. It really is up to you, which means you can stick two drives in on day one and use uh, maybe like a RAID 1 or an SH arm or on, on a second, and then later on down the system's life, start adding more larger drives. Um, again, when it comes to compatibility, although it's not featured on the list, I do know that Seagate Iron Wolf uh, 20 TB drives like this one do work in this system. They're recognized and you can use them. Currently, if you do use them, they do pop up on the unverified list because Synology only lists drives currently up to 18 TB. Weird because Synology only release up to 18 TB, but WD and... Uh, Seagate have had 20 and 22 TVs for a while. Who knows what that could mean? Um, but still, you've got support of SHR, which is great because you can mix and match drives in the system. Unlike traditional RAID, where you, if you fully, fully populated this device with mixed drives in a traditional RAID, like a RAID 5, it will class every drive as the smallest available drive. So, for example, if I put a 1 TB in here and 3 10 TBs, the system would go, no, I can only see 1 TB drives and give you, in a RAID 5, 3 terabytes of storage to play with. A huge waste of storage there. Um, you're not going to do that on day one, but maybe if you go for two 4 TB drives and three years down the line add a couple of 8s, it would have been nice to be able to take advantage of those larger drives, right? Well, Synology Hybrid RAID lets you do that. What it does is calculate one of the largest available drive as redundancy. So if you put in a 1 TB and 3 10 TBs, again, who is doing that? Um, but if you did that, it would calculate 10 TB of redundancy and allow you to absorb the rest. So you'd have 21 terabytes of overall storage compared with the 3 terabytes of storage in a traditional RAID there. Yes, the performance isn't quite as high as normal RAID, as long as you've uh, keenly pointed out in their excess level series and above, but it's still lovely to have that fluid RAID option inside there. And it's combined with lots of system software um, storage options there, such as taking advantage of snapshots there, taking advantage of BTRFS inside there, and uh, again, added uh, DSM 7.2 editions such as support of worm, uh, write once, read many, encrypted volumes and more. So the storage capabilities of this are very very good. However it cannot be expanded. More on that later on. Um, the inside of the system there we can see there plenty of ventilation once again all the way around the internal metal chassis. We've got the four SATA ports, no separate SATA around power, just direct board connections there, no loose wires and the trays just run straight there all the way through into the system. Um, also, you may see while we're looking inside there, the little memory ports there on the side, or I should say memory ports, memory port, but more on that later on. But if you're going to upgrade the memory, that is where your slot lives, just there on the inside. Um, again, I really like the chassis design. I like the storage capabilities of it. And talking of storage capabilities, boop, we've got to talk about these guys. Now, these guys here at the bottom are another level of interest. When you get hold of this device, it also includes not only the four SATA bays, but two NVMe bays. They arrive unpopulated. I've already put drives in there for the software portion of this video. Um, and I'll tell you right now, I've got good and bad news for you. But again, we will have to investigate more as the review goes on. Um, number one, these M2 NVMe bays aren't only available for caching, but now you can use them for storage pools. Now, why is that a big deal? Well, I'm glad you asked. A bit weird if you didn't. Um, caching, uh, in terms of Synology utilization, is when in terms of read caching, um, frequently accessed files, traditionally very small I.O. level data, copies of it are placed on the SSDs when the system learns that that data has been frequently accessed there when it lives on the hard drives. And then moving forward, when that I.O. small level data is being requested again in the future, the system learns to pull it from the faster SSDs rather than the slower hard drives there. Now in write caching, that is when data is being sent to the system and the system writes it to the SSD and then internally moves it over to the hard drives there, but thereby improving 
um, the performance of upload to the system and internal handling as it moves it over. Read write caching is great stuff, but many users for many, many years have wanted to use these bays since they were first introduced in 2017-18 for use as storage pools. That is when these drives, which are much, 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 much faster than that of hard drives, to be used for the main storage. Now, again, I mentioned good news and bad. One, you can use this for storage pools. This system allows you to utilize those two, two M2 NVMe bays as standalone storage pools. You can't use it for DSM. Currently, you can't install the OS on it, but you can install applications on that volume. You can run VMs from that volume. You can run um, high performance, high frequency um, databases from those SSDs, you know, things like uh, containers as well. All of that can be ran from those. But do bear in mind that Solidity, once again, is being a little bit tricksy about compatibility of the M2 and VMEs inside this system, but more on that later on. On top of that, when it comes to those two M2 and VME bays, you don't have to use them both for a storage pool or caching. You can use one for a caching, if you wish, for read caching, and the other one you can use as a storage pool. But ultimately, what that means is this four bay is technically a six bay NAS in terms of storage capabilities there. And again, Synology provide their own SSDs that you can utilize in this in a few different uh, storage configurations. Ultimately, Although this is a system that, and we'll talk about this later, is compared a lot against that of the DS920 that arrived in summer 2020 and is still very hard to buy right now, but very sought after. Although there are a lot of comparisons being made by myself and others, it has to be said that the 920 does not allow officially M2 NVMEs as storage pools and this does. But I think that is enough about the design and storage capabilities, at least on the hardware level. Let's talk a little bit about this system's ports and connections. Now, I'll be straight with you, the ports and connections on this are a little underwhelming. There was a time uh, when I would talk about uh, NAS devices from Synology in the kind of value series, the more affordable tier, where I wouldn't rag on them too much. But with this device and Synology's reshaping of its portfolio to kind of rejig where different devices live and their capabilities within the overall portfolio from Synology, that means that where this device now sits, these ports are not as good as they should be. We've already ragged on quite significantly about the USB port there, but I think the big discussion here, and I'm sure a lot of you are going to talk about in the comments, are these network ports there. Now, let's stay a little bit positive, shall we? Because those two network ports there, you've got two of them. So you've got support of things like link aggregation uh, and uh, multipath now, of course, with the SMB3 update. Um, that means that although they are 1 GBE, 1 gigabit Ethernet, up to 109 megabytes per second, uh, you've got two of them. So you can combine them and get something like, you know, 215, 220 megabytes per second on its day, on a good day. You can get that by combining them with either a lag or port trunk supported switch or with that multi-path enabled on either end. Now, why am I giving it stick? Because right now, everyone, and I mean everyone, even unbranded at this price point, are giving you at least 2.5 gigabit ethernet. Two and a half times that of those ports there. The cost of 2.5 GBE on a hardware construction level is peanuts and it blows my mind that this device is still arriving with 1 GBE. Now recently a few months ago Synology rolled out the DS923 Plus. Not only did that have 1 GBE but we didn't rag on it as hard. Why? Because it had a 10 gigabit ethernet upgrade option. This doesn't have that. Not only does it not have an expandability that I mentioned earlier on so you can't add on that 5 band expansion but you can't upgrade the network connectivity in any way. What I mean by that is, there is no way for you to use, for example, uh, let's find one here, a USB to 2.5 gigabit ethernet adapter. So you can't use one of these $20 upgrades to add um, 2.5 gigabit ethernet here and put another one on your connected client system, boom. You've got 250 to 270 megabytes per second transmission on a single port. It doesn't support that on there. Not only do you not have access to that, you don't have access to a USB to five gigabit ethernet adapter. So that's five to 545, 50 megabytes per second via a bus powered USB network adapter there. But with no option to get this upgraded to 10 GBE, you are being decidedly thrilled. now. 
Most users would argue that one, 2.5 GBE is by no means ubiquitous and it's nowhere near as commonplace as one GBE. Fine, I get that, but more routers are arriving with 2.5G, more switches are arriving with 2.5G, more client hire. I bought a new laptop recently, the 2.5 GBE off the bat from Asus. 2.5 GB is a lot more common than you think, and largely because it's just as affordable as 1G, and it's a nice, easy upgrade to give people. And this not having 2.5 GBE by default, it feels like that was a conscious choice to not include it, rather than go, oh, we can't stretch the budget towards it. Um, secondly, with the lack of 2.5 GBE on this, there are users out there that would argue, well, I wouldn't bother with 2.5 G, I'd go straight up to 10 G. Fine, give me a 10G option. Let me use my Thunderbolt to 10 GBE adapter and connect with this over a thousand megs or so, but not giving me the option to upgrade the, uh, the network connectivity and give me such low network connectivity off the bat is a real pain in the bum. And you're right, a lot of you may not take advantage of the 2.5 GBE, but at least include it for those users that will at the same price point there. This is a great device in terms of network connectivity to get um, connecting it to the wider network and all the functionality and features of 1GBE. I'm just real annoyed that this device has arrived on the scene with 1G off the bat, particularly when even one of these bays would oversaturate um, a 1GBE connection. And to give me four drives that in a RAID could get somewhere in the region with conventional drives at five to 600 meg, with enterprise drives get closer to seven or 800 meg, and with SSDs oversaturate a 10 GBE connection, this has got the capability to massively exceed those two ports. And it's just annoying that that's all you're getting off the bat here. And last thing, and I will stop ragging on this, but it's just, it's such an important point. Right now, as much as NAS is, um, try to compete and in some cases uh, collaborate and synchronize with cloud providers like Google, like Dropbox, like um, AWS, like uh, Microsoft, all of those cloud service providers, and then working with them for an on-prem bare metal synchronized point with things like Active Backup. As good as that all is, right now you can get internet speeds greater than a gigabit, okay? So if you're getting speeds greater than a gigabit, that means there is the potential, although you will have to get the right kind of file transmission storage bucket, there is the potential for me to be on my laptop here, right here at the desk with the NAS here, and have a faster speed connecting to a server with a greater than gigabit internet connection somewhere else in the world than it, I can get connecting directly with this device point to point. That's messed up. I, the reason I'm buying a NAS is not only for true data ownership and control, but also for performance. And 1GBE on this device, although not everyone is going to take advantage of greater than gigabit Ethernet, I think this should have arrived with at least one 2.5 GBE port or an option to upgrade with that wonderful little 10G adapter, which, although is proprietary, is still incredibly user-friendly, or give me the option to add that USB adapter, or wherever it's gone, that USB to 2.5 GB adapter. Give me one of those. And yes, you can enable them unofficially, but that's the point, unofficially. You might be voiding your support and warranty. This is a good device in terms of connectivity for base level users, but particularly for users that are gonna be connecting this into an existing switch. So you've got 100 meg to play with, and then you've got 10 different users connecting with it you're starting to slice up that connectivity. And yes, you can apply quality of service, uh, priority of service control within a switch, but it's still only 100 meg to play with, you know? Um, but again, I'm not awe inspired by the connections of this, and I don't think it's designed to be, but I think it would be remiss not to at least highlight the disappointment of only one GBE on this device overall. But before we get onto the hardware and the software of this device, I think what we should do is take a moment to talk about the little elephant in the room known as the DS920 Plus. That is right, a brief intermission in today's review to talk about these two because I think anyone that's been well versed with Synology over the last few years will be thinking this. It'll be remiss not to highlight it. And that is that the hardware inside the DS423 Plus is frighteningly similar despite its release in March 2023 with the uh, July released 2020 DS920. Coming up close to three years between them in release. And this device arrives with an Intel J4125 uh, and two gig of DDR4 memory that can be upgraded 
to 6 gig inside there, okay? So that CPU, that J4125, is a quad-core 2.0 gigahertz processor that can burst up to 2.7 gigahertz. It also has integrated graphics on that 4-core four 4-thread four processor, and that uh, starts at 350 megahertz uh, graphical capability there that can be upgraded, I believe, to 750 megahertz, or pushed, I should say, and burst when needed with that integrated graphic, which is great for video encoding, transcoding, great for VMs, and just generally server-side graphical manipulation in a multitude of different ways. And that 2 gig of DDR4 memory can be upgraded up to 6 gig of DDR4 memory there because the 2 gig of memory inside is soldered to the board, can't be removed, and the slot inside only supports a 4 gig Synology upgrade module, module non-ECC, um, and it's 2,666 megahertz. Now, I said all of that because I already know all of that, and I didn't even need to read it off the script. Why is that? Because it's the same damn hardware as the 2020 release box. The 920 is frighteningly sought after at the moment because when Synology rolled out the DS923+, Plus, and even early information came out about it in autumn winter 2022, a lot of users knew that this Intel powered box with that same CPU, four gig of memory mind, by the way, that can be upgraded to eight gig, the four gig soldered upgrade slot there. This device meant that at that time, this, you know, on sale in a lot of offers for about 440 to about 480 nicker in some places, again, regional currency and more attached, made it incredibly desirable. And right now, in March 2023, so many users are wondering why the 4T3 is arriving with near enough identical hardware to a device from three years prior. And there are reasons for that that I'll get into in a second. But just remember that when you're making this comparison, bear in mind, you can't really get this anymore. You can pick it up second hand and the odd one appears on the odd e-retailer, but the door has largely closed. Synology have even done as much on their own to say it's discontinued on their lineup of products. So don't think, oh, I'm going to go for because this is actually starting to increase in price online as well. But why is it that they have got the same hardware? Well, this isn't the first time we've seen Synology take hardware from a release um, and then a few years later during a refresh take that same hardware and give it to a lower tier in their portfolio. Remember earlier on when I talked about their portfolio and layout of devices being shifted around? Well, you know, a few years ago when the 920 was released, the 920 was released as kind of the premium, fully featured prosumer 4 bay there. And underneath it was announced known as the DS420 Plus. It was a dual core instead of a quad core. It was two gig instead of four gig. It was non-expandable, whereas this is expandable. And it had the same M2 NVMe slots, but for the most part, it was just a NAS that had its wings clipped and it took away some of the bells and whistles and it gave people a more affordable fully featured option rather than going full 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 prosumer but that hardware architecture in the 920 in this new generation has gone down to that tier that was originally a dual core tier that's why we're seeing Synology handing that down and Arguably, there are not a lot of happy users about this because although it's not unheard of for, for Synology to take an existing hardware set and move it into a lower tier in its portfolio, at a periodic refresh two or three years down the line, even Intel have ceased production of this CPU from what I can see online. Intel have since moved from the J4125 into the N5000 uh, in series, into the J6000 series of processors there. Indeed, in the last gener in the most recent generation, most of Synology's competitors competitors that are still rolling out Celeron processors are going for that N5000 CPU with a higher clock speed and higher capability and efficiency, or they've gone for the J6412 processor there again. Higher clock speed, higher capabilities, higher graphical uh, capabilities. And it's just weird that Synology have gone Intel Celeron on this, which is a lot of people wanted, but they've gone for a CPU that's super old a 2019-2020 generation CPU. Now, I'm not going to knock its capabilities. One, it runs DSM like an absolute dream. This 920 still runs the software beautifully well there. On top of that, it is a great CPU for Indeed, your Plex Media Server capabilities for running a few containers, maybe running one little VM there in the background, surveillance station, multiple cameras, all of those features and services. It is a good CPU. It's just a bit of a jip that a 2007, uh, 2023 system priced at 2023 prices is using a hardware architecture that 
as little as four to five months ago, you could make a tremendous saving on and buy right at a very, very affordable price comparatively. It's not a bad hardware architecture. I'm just not keen on the way it has been presented now when we could have had a newer generation CPU or moreover that this system arriving with two gig of DDR4 memory soldered to the board and therefore trying to add us an official soda module, module only gives you six when the CPU supports eight and you could get eight gig inside this feels like an artificial cap that a lot of users are not going to be keen on again it runs dsm great if you are coming into synology platform for synology services it is a great system but there is absolutely an argument that in terms of hardware this will disappoint a lot of users but for now let's move away from the internal hardware and talk a little bit about that dsm software arguably the jewel in the crown of the ds423 plus So going through DSM in the review of the DS423 Plus is easier said than done, largely because describing the benefits of Synology's DSM platform is a video in itself. Indeed, I even made a video in itself over here on the channel about four months ago, and it was one hour, 50 minutes long, and even then it wasn't able to cover everything. So as far as this video is concerned, I will be going through some of the highlights of the platform, but just know that if you really want to know exactly what DSM is capable of, you're going to have to check out that video that's linked below in the description there. But when you log into the platform here via the user interface, as you can see via the web browser, that's not the only means you'll go in. They include an application known as Synology Assistant that allows you to scan your local area network. At the same time, when I'm accessing the device over the local area network, there is also the means to access the NAS remotely via the internet. This is exactly the same NAS being accessed remotely here via the internet via that new Quick Connected identifier there. And I've done that by setting the device up with Quick Connect within the Synology's own supported Quick Connect service for external access when setting the device up. So interacting with the device, be it via client applications on your mobile phone, via your desktop, PC or Windows, um, PC, Mac, Linux system, it's all possible there. Again, this is a multi-user input environment here, so you can create multiple users very, very easily within the user account creation area. And those individual users can be put into groups with different levels of administration and access as well as guest users or subpar um, sub admin users that have got write only access to there and again all of that can be configured along with two-step authentication and more all within that dsm interface when i talk about dsm being kind of os level so operating system i really do mean it what you're looking at here is a full operating system accessible from within your web browser or a number of those tailored applications and talking of tailored applications there is an enormous range of apps that you can install and again it will take way way it will take several times longer than this review of the 423 plus to go through them all but to talk about some of the highlights that are included as apps and services from within dsm that run very very well from within this system for example for the business users you've got active backup for business and active backup for business is their kind of single administration panel there for uh, monitoring let's activate it um, later on this allows you to uh, back up lots of uh, different platforms everything from windows pcs uh, to mac as well that should have been rolled in very very recently and these apps and services and virtual machines and other servers it is a single portal access point to manage all of your backups on a schedule see what's happening what's going right what's going wrong and that includes uh, what, uh your virtual machine backups there with virtual platforms like hyper-v vmware there and you can even mount some of them as uh, on the nas via a bare metal hypervisor uh, within Synology now is known as Synology Virtual Machine Manager there and again you have a license included there isn't any extra licenses there you've just got access to that straight off the bat same goes if you want to synchronize with your existing um, SAAS or software as a service platform so again Google Workspace or Office 365 or Microsoft 365 to synchronize those with the NAS as a bare metal access point to those cloud platforms and then synchronize it so your connected client devices 
are communicating with the NAS rather than the cloud service. And then if you do lose internet connection, your connected devices have still got access to the cached and locally stored data on the NAS natively, as they would, you know, they're not even going to know there is a disconnection. And then when the internet connection is re-established between the NAS and that uh, cloud service in question, then it synchronizes and re-establishes all of that data that's been created in the interim there. And again, it doesn't stop there. There's just a huge degree of business apps, even though this isn't really a business focus NAS. We already talked about there with the virtual machine manager. And again, as this is a quad core NAS, you've got you know four cores to play with there and you can assign a couple of those cores if you choose to like a linux vm if you wanted to there you can assign some of those uh resources to you know um smaller uh, virtual machine environments such as utilizing docker if you choose um to uh run a small contained application all within running within the docker application much like a vm but without a hypervisor to live on it's nice living there straight on the bare metal and uh, lower resource consumption overall um Carrying on with those range of supported applications we've installed, and we want to talk about things that businesses might use, then you've got your surveillance station application, which allows you to at attach those cameras I mentioned earlier on and create that standalone service there. But one thing you may have noticed while I've been opening these applications, something I'm not going to try to disguise, is the fact that two gig of memory on this system is not quite a lot to run everything and that goes back to one of my earlier complaints when you're utilizing this system which is that when the 920 came out and it had four gig of memory four gig was a decent amount of memory to be playing with off the bat but as you can see i am running a lot of different applications at once you probably won't be running all of these together but there's still no avoiding that two gig of memory once you roll in synology's um own utilization within the system for running DSM and intelligent caching in the background that's minimized that window there, that two gig just isn't enough to really sink your teeth into everything this system can do. And even though we've got a couple of cameras here, we'll chuck those into the feed, so hopefully you'll see me in the studio in one shape or form as both of these cameras add up. I'm gonna wave my hand there in front of camera because it's slightly out of shot. Um, I will say that if you're not planning on running all of those business apps side by side, Two gig of memory will probably be enough for you. But it's once you factor in the big business apps that this includes, and I haven't even really got my teeth into the likes of Synology Drive and the rest of the collaboration suite yet, like mail and chat and calendar and stuff, that two gig of memory is going to feel oddly limiting there. They're great apps, but I do feel that the two gig of memory is going to be something of a heel for a number of users out there. And again, we've got some dedicated stuff coming up very, very soon on Surveillance Station, thanks to those Synology uh, cameras that are coming out soon, the BC500 and the TC500 there. But I think it would be fair to say that the DS43 Plus is more of a, a system for middle ground home users. It's classified as Soho or SMB. Um, so let's talk about some of those apps and services. We go into the storage manager there. Um, again, we've created ourselves a cheeky little raid on there. We've gone ahead with our storage volume. We've got three drives in a, an SHR environment there. So again, that's that Synology hybrid raid, which does allow us to uh, an element of flexibility with regard to the storage we're utilizing, although we're not taking advantage of it here, because I've only got three drives in, if I inevitably put in a fourth one, I can mix and match that capacity. Same goes, as mentioned earlier, that um, M2 NVMEs can be used for storage pools, which is great, right? We've got our second storage pool there at the bottom, and that storage pool, boom, there is a storage pool with just one drive, and it's a nice Synology NVMe running as a storage pool. Great stuff. Um, but do bear in mind that, and again, after a bit of check-in, unfortunately, you can still only use Synology M2 NVMEs to create storage pools. So, for example, if we go ahead and create ourselves our brand new storage pool there, when we look into the hard drives and SSDs, you can see that I've installed another SSD, a Silicon Motion 500 gig PCIe Gen 3 SSD. And if you have a look inside there and we try to manage that drive and we try to create a storage pool with it, it won't allow us to see that drive. We can only see the other drive that, which I've put inside there, which is a 20 TB that I'm going to talk about in a moment. We can still utilize that drive if we choose for caching, as we can still take advantage of M2 NVMe caching with third-party drives. As we can see there, if we move along, the drive appears for caching, but unfortunately, third-party drives aren't available to, for use as storage pools, even in this Plus Series system. Now, why did I talk about uh, that 20TB drive there? That's because despite this NAS not 
uh, featuring drives larger than 20 TB, it does um, allow uh, greater than 18 TB in the Synology hard drives and WD and Seagate and that. I've installed this 20 TB drive from Seagate and it is visible. It's got a healthy status there. We can utilize it and the system does allow me to use that drive. Indeed, if we go to the notifications and alerts, it has not flagged that drive as not suitable for unverified um, storage pools there. But if I go ahead and try to manage that, create a new storage pool with just that drive there, and we select that drive, we click next, as we can see now, it's warning us that it's not on the compatibility list there. So just do bear that in mind that the drive does work and we have installed it. I had to uninstall it earlier on just for this video, but you can use greater than 18 TB drives there. And you can use drives like this that aren't on the compatibility list, but I still don't recommend you do that because there's still no complete guarantee that Synology will add them and you are potentially destabilizing any kind of support that you might get from Synology down the line there. But carrying on with that home user stuff, You've got your snapshots, you've got your RAID uh, storage there, and let's talk about the collaboration suite as well. Within the collaboration suite, you've got things like the standard file management stuff where you can search the system up here, where you can search for individual applications, files, and services inside there. And that can you know, extend to using individual apps or searching files thanks to the universal search tool that Synology provide there. Indeed, with the file management there, you can use the client apps on your desktop systems, your mobile systems, to interact with the NAS on a breadcrumb file file away. And again, you've got your copy, paste, your archive, your extract, all of the stuff you'd expect from a file explorer there on any uh, Windows platform or even Mac platform with Finder. Then you've got your multimedia suite, of course, you've got your audio station there, you've got your video station that will open up in a new tab, that's Synology's alternative to the likes of Plex Media Server, and of course, you've got Synology Photos as well, that AI-supported photo application, but again, bear in mind, they have removed um, thing recognition that was available in Synology Moments, but you do have facial recognition built in there, it's just a real shame uh, that you don't have support of thing recognition for things like trees and food and stuff like that currently, but... It's support of um, uh, Apple Live images and also uh, motion images on Android platforms. You can see from GIFs being generated there. And indeed, if we go to the albums there, not only have we got geolocational data that's been scraped from the metadata on those photos, which allow us to find out where a lot of photos are taken and narrow those down. But on top of that, within the personal space, you can go ahead into the Places tab, go back. We can go into the People tab with facial recognition, the shared space. And then you can say who these people are, in my case, Robbie. And that's it moving forward those photos of me will be recognized and again you can pull out all the photos of everyone and then i'll go make them together like this one if we choose to and we can go ahead say that's me as well boom merge them and we can merge those together and if i was to choose to select this here so we go for that kt pop that merge those together so we can go to the search bar at the top if we choose it may have needed an extra moment for um uh, what's it uh, uh indexing we to look up uh, Katie and Rob in the shared space, boom, all the photos of Katie and Rob there together, it's that straightforward. So, and there's lots of things you can do in Synology Photos. Again, I recommend you check out my video just specifically on photos, but it's a great application. It's just a shame it doesn't have that thing recognition as mentioned earlier. So go to Video Station. Video Station is a great tool here. It's got that metadata scraping for all that information about the files and folders you're watching there, as you can see, and even playing the files. There's transcoding and uh, dedicated client applications for not only mobile devices and desktop, but also things like Amazon, Fire TV, and other third, and Google as well, a lot of their video stuff. Um, moving out from there, we've got the audio station there, which Although the client application, uh, sorry, the um, OS application you're seeing in DSM seems a bit middle of the road, a bit Winampy, um, there is apps for things like uh, Amazon Alexa for voice control of your media to get it playing from their smart speakers. And indeed, there are still applications for all, um, other client devices uh, that you can have from the comfort of your sofa. Um, carrying on with that collaboration suite there, again, as mentioned, we've got other little bits and bobs that we can play with. We've got a calendar application, if we choose, that allows you to either synchronize it with an existing third-party calendar, to so have that all in one place where all your connected users, or you can create a brand new one from within Synology Calendar for you to manage all of your deadlines and add to it via the mobile app too. Same goes with NoteStation too, where you can have synchronized kind of note um, apps between all of your client devices and your uh, team members or family members all in one place. Synology Chat provides an alternative to things like WhatsApp and Skype with, again, 
client applications for both desktop and mobiles and portable devices that allow you all to communicate and share files and folders and links and information privately from within the encrypted network if you choose, but also whether you want to utilize it for connecting with your clients and guests and having that closed network of shared links and communication from within your home or business environment there. Synology Drive, this is a big one, again, much bigger than this video. Synology Drive uh, gives you one of two things. It gives you, and you can have both of them, one, a single portal access point for you to access all of the information on your NAS, and this information from within your NAS it's it, uh, tailored so you can you you can open up word docs uh from within synology's office application which is an alternative to um, um uh, google docs and office uh, 365 and again we're talking word we're talking excel we're talking pptx files pdfs and more all of them tailored and openable from within this browser window but the real beauty of synology drive is when you use the client application so as you can see here, I've got Synology Drive client on this system running here in the background, and it's synchronizing with different NASes. As you can see, that's um, you can ignore that little red um, abnormal status there. That's to a different NAS that we're using for a different video, which I've now severed that connection. Ignore that. But as you can see from these others, I've allowed a connection between this NAS and my local PC. And the result is that on my local PC, I've now got here not only uh, a connection on the left hand side to three different NASes. But if we zoom in to one of these NASes, for example, the 1621XS, I can now access the contents of a NAS remotely on there, but using my client uh, file manager here. I don't have to use that uh, desktop there provided by DSM from within the web browser if I choose not to. Um, and carrying on with what can be done within there. If I choose to, for example, we've got all of these different projects that I'm working on here in a different file folder. As you can see, there's that green tick system there, much like Microsoft and um, a few other um, client applications that allow you to pin data, you can do it within your Synology NAS. What does that mean? Well, and I know I'm talking at 90 miles an hour, for example, we can go in to this folder here. Now this folder, we've got some data inside and all of these have got green ticks. That means that this file lives both on my local PC and on the NAS. But if I choose to, if I want to make sure that file is always here, I can right click, go to the contextual menu here, the menu for Synology Drive, and then choose to either pin this file permanently. So if there's any change on that file on the NAS, it's immediately always available on our local system. Or I can create a shareable link from within my client PC to share without logging into the NAS. Or I can delete the local file from my local PC and it still exists on the NAS, but now I can still see that. Now an example of that, will be if we go to a lot older files here. So instead of that green tick, we're starting to see the little cloud symbol. And what the little cloud symbol means is that means this file lives on the NAS. And if I choose to, I can log in and see the file folder structure of these files from within my system. But as you can see, some of these files, instead of having the green tick, have got the little cloud symbol. So if I right click that file and go to properties, you'll see that even though that file is 3.55 gig in size it's taking up zero room on my local pc and that's because i can see the file folder structure of the nas but i don't have to store the files on my local system and if i wanted that file locally i just right click go to synology drive and, and pin locally or i can just double click that file to play it and then it will automatically download the file from the nas onto my pc allowing me to watch it and then it will substitute that with that green tick there so it's a nice way to be able to interact with the nas on my local machine without taking up any space but still being able to see the whole file folder structure but utilizing my own os file explorer then you can create connections with the nas not only on your local area network but multiple so if you're running um, a, an extended network where it's you and a bunch of your team members all communicating with the nas you can set them all up to be able to access those team folders from within drive and heading back into drive bring that back up there Again, ignore the red symbol there. What you can also do is change a lot of the terms there. So as you can see from within there, not only can we choose to, if we create a connection there, we go for this connected folder there, it will find the NASs on the local area network, and then we can add these NASs to our list of extended drive folders there. So there is our 423, 
there is we go into there log in with our password credentials we're not going to worry about ssl because it's a local video thing here otherwise it might slow things down uh, we're not going to establish a remote connection although we could if we chose to once we've logged in we can go ahead and choose files and folders from within the nas there so for example we can go ahead and choose maybe the team folder there that one we used earlier on and then on the local pc we'll allow it to access a certain directory on my local pc as you can see here so i can go ahead and select d drive there and it will create a new Synology drive folder and then from there we can choose some rules so we can say that we only want to synchronize one of these folders if we choose we can then choose that we only want certain file sizes certain file uh, formats and then we can choose how and when we want it saved do we want to enable that on-demand sync that we just talked about I hate seagulls or we can go ahead and create two-way synchronizations or even one way and within um, Synology Drive we can even create some retention policies as well so it's a really nice application that I recommend for many now many of you may be looking at this NAS for multimedia purposes and of course we're talking for most users about Plex Media Server and I will say that this runs Plex Media Server are very well because of that integrated graphics CPU but bear in mind this is still a CPU from 2019 and 2020 although that integrated graphics will mean that server-side transcoding will improve uh, performance general 4k and 1080p is still going to be comparable to a lot of other NASs out there and unless you're going to take advantage of that hardware those hardware graphical resources within your own multimedia setup for HEVC and more do check out my Plex video on this NAS very soon you may not need them on your own side and there are other newer CPUs out there in the NAS world that you may want to consider overall DSM runs very very well on this system and I've barely scratched the surface of what DSM brings to the table it's just a real shame that that two gig of memory creates a kind of forced bottleneck for those of you that really want to expand the apps and services you want to use and that extends to we haven't even talked about some of the backup applications such as uh, the hyper backup application or the usb synchronization tools that would allow you to not only synchronize with a cloud service but on top of that with hyper backup allow you to back up to a local usb drive uh, back up to another nas back up to um, uh, cloud-based synchronization so again lots of added services and options available to you with many many providers supported all the way through it's a great range of apps and services just bear in mind that if you're going to be using more than a handful of these five or six of these that two gig of memory is going to feel a little bit limited when i haven't really pushed how i'm using these apps and we're still using 64 percent again yes a lot of apps but still nonetheless there's a lot of resources being used even just generally in the background and it will intelligently flush the cache when needed but I do think if you're going to use this in any more than a standard home user way, you're going to have to upgrade that memory. And for some of you, that instantly makes the 920 that came before it a more desirable choice. But that's enough of the software. Let's head back into the Canberra studio and summarise today's review. So let's conclude today's review what do we think well let's be honest about this if you're coming to this device because of Synology software Synology services it's user friendly applications it's replacement for third parties out there and just generally hand holding you into the world of network storage in the most user friendly way with its OS unquestionably this succeeds that software is still the absolute adonis the absolute tibbity tobbity now software in the market right now for os operating system level interaction with a nas device you really can't do better than a synology and the 423 plus still maintains a very high standard of capability from dsm as well as supporting those newer generation 7.2 level features in the beta currently but hopefully when it rolls out and the fact that it supports those m2 nvmes as storage pools can't be questioned because that is just a newer feature that's only really arriving with newer NASs. yes the way Synology have rolled it out isn't fantastic, and I think a lot of users would like to have seen it done another way, but at least it's available here, turning this 4-bay into a lovely little potential 6-bay as well, whether you want to use it for caching or not. On top of that, one of the main reasons I think a lot of users are going to go for this device 
is because in terms of multimedia management, it's a great little buy there. When you're coming to someone that's buying it for Plex Media Server, Jellyfin, or like MB and stuff like that, or even simple DLNA stuff, or using Solidity Video Station app, the hardware architecture here is gonna get the job done well. Yes, not everyone's gonna need transcoding, and if you're running on client-side operations, you're utilizing devices that already support a whole range of file formats. You're not gonna be watching a phone on the tube. You're not gonna be trying to watch HGVC high-end deep media that needs transcoding because your device can't hack it, you're gonna be fine anyway. But for everyone else that needs server-side hardware to get the job done because they're utilizing devices that need the file compressed because their lack of bandwidth or they don't have HEVC client um, support and they can't apply a license on there, that level of hardware is gonna be great to see, notwithstanding how that hardware architecture is gonna help you in terms of other DSM and third-party applications and services that are far more graphical in how your data is presented to you. Another thing, I like the broader hardware, uh, hard drive and SSD compatibility when Synology and within DSM 7.1 and indeed 7.2 in the future has kind of changed the boundaries on hard drive and SSD compatibility on their platform and support. This still has a much broader compatibility of all the different hard drives in the market. Though I would argue their position on M2 NVMEs for storage pools and drives above 18 TB at the time of recording, well, not as good as they could be. And of course, I love this chassis. I'm always gonna love this chassis. It is small, it is contained, it is well ventilated, it is low impact, still managing to do an incredible job of maintaining your storage 24 seven and still pretty easy on the eye. Is it perfect? Of course not. One, I ragged about it, those one GBE ports. No, 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 no. I'm just not happy about that at all. The two gig of memory by default, which although is great for running DSM, it runs very well on two gig of memory there. I don't like the artificial cap towards six gig that it's inadvertently created to have that onboard soldered memory which although i'm sure improves uh, memory transition speeds it's still really annoying i'm losing a potential two gig of uh, max cap memory that i can have on this device i don't like that it's a 2019 20 intel celeron processor in there you know there are newer celerons they could have put a new celeron in there and they simply haven't it is a great CPU. It is at least a, a four-bay Synology disk station with a Celeron, but it's a super old CPU compared to what we're seeing from competitors right now. I don't like that it's non-expandable, but I can't really rag on it because non-expandability on this device is kind of part of this series' remit. But just bear in mind, the four base is the end of the road. You've got your SHR, you've got your BTR RFS, you've got those supported services in DSM 7.2, but still nonetheless, I, the fact that it's not expandable means it's arriving with a lower glass ceiling. And of course, it's just too darn similar to that of the DS920, which means a lot of users that either bought the 920 at launch and it's coming towards the end of its three year hardware warranty and they're thinking about buying a new device are not gonna wanna go for this. They're gonna be like, it's too similar to what I've got. It's not a sufficient enough upgrade. And if they go for the 923 plus, that's got that 10G upgrade and ECC memory, which is all great stuff. It doesn't have integrated graphics, which is one of the reasons the 920 did so well. And for users in the 916 and 918 generation that are well, well, well outside their warranty that decided to skip the original 920 and wait it out to see what the 923, 922 uh, would have looked like, they're gonna see this device in the 423 plus and think, I should have just gone for that previous generation and not lived outside my warranty all this time. But again, it's more about the software than the hardware with the Synology. It is a good solution, but I don't think we can say it is changing the way NAS is being done. And if Synology had rolled this one out before the 923 or had released this earlier in uh, 2022, I think we would look down on it a little bit more favorably because we would look at it as the successor to the DS420 Plus. We would not look at it as we do right now as a weak sideline from the 920 that existed before it. So it really is coming down to whether you're an existing user or not. But this has been my review of the DS423 Plus. A good NAS, but not exactly changing the game too much and not exactly gonna blow your socks off compared to predecessors. A good NAS, but probably for newer Synology users than older Synology users. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this. Again, there's a much shorter form version of this review linked in the description. You can check that out, as well as the full detailed written review over on NAS Compares 2. I would recommend you check that out. If you're still on the fence about which NAS or data storage or network setup for your needs, use the free advice section over on NAS Compares. It's the big blue button on the side of the NAS Compare page, or there should be a link to it below, where you can speak to me or Eddie, who will help you out with your data storage needs for free. There are 
ways and means and paid things on there where you can like hire one of us on a zoom to talk you through a consultation or you can use it for a kind of network uh, troubleshooting there for you but to be honest just use the free one it will take us a few extra days to answer and you still get the same thing so why not just use the free one right on top of that there's a free advice section uh, the free community advice uh, forum ask nas compares to check out link below again me eddie who argued is on there more than i am and other nas users that can help you out and finally if you've enjoyed this video very important and if you're going to shop from amazon anyway for this or any other nas product please please use the links in the description to take you to amazon just click the link it will take you to your amazon store it doesn't cost you a penny it doesn't affect any of your cookies or anything like that but by doing that when you get there anything and i mean anything you buy results in a kickback coming here to nas compares and that allows me and eddie it's just us here to keep doing what we do it's a real passive easy way to support content creators like us thank you so much for watching and i will see you next time